he wiped my face with his shirt the best he could, and I fought to regain control of myself. I'm fine, I said, and waved High Rider away. I'm fine. I looked at Bear. He was lying on the porch, dead, skull leaking that strange green slime. And it was inside of him, I said numbly. That's probably inside all of them, High Rider said. He grabbed his shotgun and got up. Uh, it's not the stones we gotta worry about. It's everybody here. This was far worse than I thought. Far, far worse. Feeling more unready than I ever had in my life, I got up, and together we went inside. Inside the living room was dark and silent, shapes looming from the shadows like hidden monsters. My grip tightened on the sledgehammer, and beside me, High Rider held his shotgun tight to his chest. The only sound was the ragged hiss of our own exhalations, and holding my breath, I listened. Nothing. Where was Cat? Bear died, loudly, and if Cat was here, he'd surely have come down to see what was happening. Maybe he was gone. Well, maybe he was dead. I squinted my eyes and peered into the shadows, trying to pick out the slightest movement. There were none. We were alone. Feeling bold, I flipped the switch by the door and light filled the room, revealing a comfortably furnished space. An afghan was draped over the back of the sofa, framed pictures hung on the walls, and the combination TV and turntable occupied a corner. We stay together, I whispered to High Rider. He nodded. First, we checked the living room, looking in every conceivable space in which someone could conceal themselves. Then we moved on to the kitchen. We looked in cabinets, in closets, even in the crawl space under the house. We found nothing. Next, we climbed the stairs, High Rider's shotgun leading the way. Three closed doors greeted us. High Rider chose the one on the right. And that's where we found the body. Cat's wife and their two children, a boy and a girl, eight and ten, were tied up in the master bedroom. They lay on the bed side by side, faces buried in the mattress. Blood soaked the blanket and the carpet, splattered the headboard, the walls, the lamp, everything. An axe jutted from the little girl's back, Brass shell casings from a rifle littered the floor. My stomach turned and High Rider went pale as a ghost. He turned around, looking dazed, and stumbled out into the hall. I followed a minute later, feeling like I was going to be sick. What now? High Rider asked. He sounded defeated, as if finding those three innocents had taken whatever fight and life he had left in him. Oh, we call Huntsville, I said. Together, High Rider and I left that house of horrors and crossed the prison grounds, neither one of us talking. The weight of the things we'd seen, and of the things we'd learned, was heavy between us. I don't know what he was thinking, but my thoughts were grim. There was no coming out of this alive, even if High Rider let me come with him. I was probably infected, just like all the others. Even if I wasn't, once this thing got out, it was a wrap. Not just for me, but for the entire world. All of human civilization would be gone. Dead. Infected by that alien scum shit. Inside the prison, we made our way to Cat's office. I opened the door and went in first. Before I knew what was happening, someone jammed a gun against the nape of my neck and shoved me forward. High Rider let out a grunt. When I looked back, a mix of black and white guys in loincloths, their faces and chests painted with blood, were holding his arm. I told you, you can defeat us, a withered voice said. The swivel chair, facing the window, turned. And when I saw Cat, I gasped. Once muscular and tall, Cat was shriveled and bony now. Most of his hair and teeth had fallen out and his skin was dotted with oozing boils and blisters. His eyes were milky white, just as bears had been, and his toothless smile seemed impossibly white. In his hands, he held his precious stone like a newborn baby. The light from it was blinding. A 
I could feel its baking heat against my face, and I turned my head slightly to the side. In the weeks since we dug that damn thing out of the earth, that chunk, or cat's chunk, was the biggest I had seen. Both cat and bear spent so much of their day around it, and they'd both withered away to nothing. Other guys got sick, others killed themselves, but none of them were as bad off as cat and bear. Then, all at once, I understood. That piece was the most powerful. The other ones, the ones Cat had ordered scattered around the prison, probably at the unwitting behest of the alien in his mind, were nothing. Now this was the seed of power. The other ones could do small-scale damage, but this bad boy right here, this was the world ender. The mothership. I had to get it away from him. We're going to suck the life force from your planet and then spit your bones out when we're done, Cat said. He stroked the stone and it began to pulse. When we're done, we're going to move on just like we always have. But you'll stay here to rot. He laughed. I like to think of myself as a thoughtful man. No thought went into what I did next. I merely reacted like an animal in a corner. I ran my elbow back into my captor's guts with all my might and ducked my head to the side to avoid taking his bullet. He let out a pained oof and stumbled back, falling against one of the men holding High Rider. High Rider hooked his foot around the leg of the man holding him and tripped him. He then wrenched his arm away and his captors jumped on him. They all fell into the hole in a writhing heap. I spun around and clocked the guy who had his gun on me. I hit him so hard that his neck snapped and he dropped, the gun landing on the floor. Get him! Get him! Cat cried. He sounded afraid. The next thing I knew, I was throwing myself across the desk at Cat. Instead of going for his eyes, though, I went for the stone. I grabbed it in both hands and my palms sizzled against his red hot screamed in agony but refused to let go. Gritting his teeth, Cat tried to yank it away, but he was too weak. I pulled my way. He pulled his. It was a high-stakes game of tug of war. I could feel my skin melting and fusing to the rock. Finally, summoning a reserve of strength I didn't know I had, I wrestled the rock free from Cat's grip. He jumped to his feet, reaching for it and wailing in a mixture of pain and fear. His face twisted and his knees went out from under him. He fell, held onto the desk and tried to pull himself to his feet, but couldn't. The last thing I heard from the cat's mouth was a pathetic, Please, come back. Round one. I could never describe the amount of excruciating pain I was in holding that rock, so I won't even try. Imagine picking up a steel rod glowing orange with heat, you might get an idea. I refused to let it go, though. Maybe I'm stupid. Maybe I was mad. I don't know. This thing was the most dangerous element, weapon, whatever, that had ever been, and I finally had it. Didn't know what the hell I was going to do with it, but I wasn't going to put it down and let it get away. Even if it killed me. I ran into the hall with it, where High Rider struggled with a pile of guards. My throat felt like it was going to rip wide open and my head took on that dreamy, dizzy sensation you get right before you pass out. The stone grew hotter and began flashing faster. In my haze state, I somehow knew it was going to explode. Once it did, the spores would spread far and wide. Weaker maybe, but in time... Oh, in time. Getting hold of his revolver, High Rider elbowed one of the men off of him and shot another in the head. His face was bloody, with blood oozing from bite wound on his neck and hands. One ear was completely gone and his face was pale from blood loss. One of the men slammed into him, and the gun went flying. At last I could take no more. I flung the rock to the floor, fell against the wall, and looked at my hands. They were raw and bloody, long strands of skin melting from them like gooey cheese from a freshly baked pizza. The stone flashed faster, emitting an ear-rattling dum, 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 like the blades of a helicopter. My survival instincts kicked in, and I struggled down the hall, using the wall to keep myself upright. 
We gotta go. I screamed. I rider shoved his final adversary back, brought the gun weakly up, and fired. The round took the dude in the head, and he slumped back. I rider then tried to get to his feet, but was too weak. The stone was flashing faster now, louder. Someone called out, and suddenly the hall was flooded with people, the last remnants of Anderson units, inmates and building tenders alike. They were in varying states of plague, death, and madness, and they all ran at me. I rider managed to squeeze a single shot off before they were upon him. Screaming, I loped down the hall. I reached the door and slammed through it just as the stone exploded. Fire licked my back and the force of the blast threw me up and forward. I hit the ground and rolled. The whole world seemed to lurch and a violent shudder raced through the building. I got to my hands and knees, but a muffled voice stopped. I looked up, and my stomach dropped. Two of them, carrying flamethrowers, stood over me, respirators on their faces. I had completely forgotten that Cat had sent some of the stone to a university to be studied. I had no idea that Washington was on high alert, and that the government had been converging on Anderson for hours. As I passed out, my only thought was, I wish you'd all gotten here earlier. And then, I slept. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. The walls were sterile, the overhead light was blinding, and everything was made out of chrome. For a terrible second, I was sure that I'd been abducted by the same aliens who'd sent their spores to Earth. But then a human voice crackled through a loudspeaker, staying my fear. I was in a top-secret government facility, he told me, and was being kept there for observation. I was there for over ten years. Every day and all night long, they poked, prodded, and studied me. Early on, they told me that I was immune to the spores, that I'd felt some of their effects, but there was something about my DNA that protected me. They told me later that roughly 25% of the human population shared my immunities. They were afraid that I would develop complications, or that there was something inside of me, lying dormant and waiting to wake one day in the future. But they never found anything. Enemy team nearing the lab, I later learned, was deep beneath a mountain somewhere in the Rockies. I'm not too sure, but I think the government used it to research weaponized smallpox, plague, and superflu. I have no hard evidence of this, but from the things I overheard, the spore samples they took from Anderson was one of the least deadly things down there with us. For a long time, they wouldn't tell me what happened to Anderson, just that it was taken care of. Over the years, I pieced together the story. First, they sprayed fire and fury on every single building in the complex. There were no doubt men still alive in there. They torched it anyway. Maybe that was for the best. Next, they took control of the property and cordoned it off. To this day, it belongs to the government and is heavily guarded. Every so often, they take tests of the soil and the water. There are legends saying that you get sick or lose your mind if you go too close. You get better just so long as you stay clear of it. The locals say it's haunted. They each other ghost stories about the spirits of vanished prison. Oh, if only that were the case. They finally let me out of the hospital in 1991 and sent me back to TDC. They swore me to secrecy and had a thousand dollars a month for my books to keep me quiet. They promised they'd help me get payroll and finally did after 42 straight years in. I went back to Anderson in 2018, getting as close as the old dirt service road before seeing the first camera and the no trespassing sign. As soon as I got out of the car, I could feel the tension in the air. Those spores are still out there. Not enough of them to do what they did to Bear and Cat, but sometimes I wonder about the men who guard the place. And they're always around it day after day, shift after shift. They have nightmares. They hack and sweat. Do they bleed green when they nick themselves shaving? I have no answers to those questions, and honestly, I don't know if I want any. If life has taught me one thing, it's this. Sometimes, you're better off not knowing the truth. Ugh. <sighs>
<laughs> yep, so recorded that one pretty much in uh, one go. Two and a half hours of recording, then edited down to just about the two hour mark. Hope it was worth it for you all. I really love that one, and um, I think you would too. <laughs> That's why I recorded it. So, a big shout out to uh, Joseph Rubus, the author of that one. Uh, if you feel like buying a coffee for him, then, well, I'll put the link in the description below. So, do, do him a favor and just say, well, well, thank you very much for writing that and um, delivering a wonderful story to the doc. Here's a coffee money for you. <laughs> what am I talking about? Anyway, yeah, it would be very much appreciated, so uh, please bear that in mind. Well, that's a huge one. Brain has gone, obviously, as you can tell from the way I'm waffling on here. I'll be back again very, very soon. Till the next time, my dear friends. Very, very sweet dreams. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Oh, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hope to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dream. Bye bye. of victory. Another one down. Shields are down. 